Yeah, I need a ride. This is a perfectly healthy child. What's unhealthy are birth alerts, a racist practice that may stop this indigenous mother from going home with her newborn. Become an ally. Rise above racism in healthcare. You're watching Rogers TV. Hello, everybody. My name is Jason Piercy, and this is Out of the Fog. No time for chit chat. This episode is chock full of really good financial advice with an insolvency trustee and a mortgage broker. All you need to know, we'll be right back after this. Welcome back to Out of the Fog. Okay, uh, let's talk about money. And let's talk about money with somebody, Nancy Snedden. Hi, thank you for coming out. Hi, Jason. Glad to be here. Um, you are the president of BDO Canada and a licensed insolvency trustee. I am. First things first, what's BDO? It's a really good question. We get people who call actually all the time and say, um, BDC? No, this is BDO, right? And sometimes the colors, the logos even look similar. Yes. So BDO Canada, uh, we're a full service accounting consulting firm. And BDO Canada Limit, of which I'm the president, is a licensed insolvency trustee. So we help people in financial difficulty right across the Canada, been in business doing this for over 50 years. Um, so consumer proposals and bankruptcies mostly, but we also provide other sorts of advice when it comes to how to restructure your debt and get back on your feet. So for anybody who might not necessarily know the formal definition of insolvency, or as I sort of understand it, or practical definition, is basically you have this much money that comes in regularly, and you owe this much money out regularly, and if the amount that's going out is more than what's coming in, you are insolvent. Yeah, is that absolutely. roughly true? Absolutely. So the pure definition under the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act, which of course is federal regulation, is that you have to owe at least $1,000 and you can't meet your bill commitments as they come due or your assets and liabilities are not, um, are, are, there's no extra, right? Your assets aren't worth more than, than your liabilities. In most cases, the people who come in, it's a, a mix of all of those things, right? They always owe more than $1,000. That's never a, a high bar. Um, for most people, it's that they either can't make their minimum payments as they come due on a regular basis. Uh, and sometimes it's because they're robbing Peter to pay Paul. So yeah. they're making the minimum payments, but it's because they're using credit to pay credit or they're able to make the minimum payment, but they can't pay more than that. So that's still insolvent because you can't actually pay off your debt, right? You're just getting by because you're making the minimum payment, but okay, you're not yeah. actually getting a reduction. So let's touch on that for a second. So let's say you owe um, $5,000 on your credit card mm -hmm. and you have a monthly minimum payment of 100 bucks, maybe roughly something like that. Um, that $100, Paying that minimum payment will not reduce your debt whatsoever. That's just burned money to pay off interest that has accrued over the last month or so, mm -hmm. and you pay that $100 a month in perpetuity and still owe $5,000. Yeah, that is, is pretty much the case. There's usually a very small amount that might be coming off the principal, but you'll see a number of years ago they put a new regulation in that the credit card companies had to put on the bottom of the statement, if you only make your minimum payment, this is how long it will take you to pay off your debt. And in most cases, it's startling. 
it's <laughs> many, many, many years, which, which tells you, right, that the most that you're paying is not actually reducing the balance. And for people, usually they're using their credit, they're actually increasing their balance over time, not reducing it by making the minimum payment because they're continuing to use the credit yes. until they're at their limit. Yeah, we, and revolving credit, just meaning money that you have access to that you can borrow from, pay off and borrow again, and mm -hmm. it can be very, very useful yeah. um, if you can manage it. And a survey was done recently mm -hmm. about stigma associated with death. And I'd like if you could, because I, I mean, there's a lot of numbers and stats in there, but the general consensus of said survey is? So the general consensus is that people do not want to talk about debt. They don't want to talk about financial difficulty, not with family, not with friends, not with a professional. They just feel like it's something that they shouldn't talk about. So 56% of Canadians said, no, we, we're just not comfortable talking about debt. And that number was higher than people being comfortable with talking about relationship issues, which is 51%, or medical things, which was 43%. So debt ranks up above those two items and what people are actually comfortable talking about. And if you come back to Atlantic Canada, the number is actually higher. So 63% of Atlantic Canadians say, no, I can't talk to anybody, including family and friends, co-workers, doesn't matter who it is, I can't talk to anybody about debt. And for those who are struggling with debt or feel like they can't manage their debt. It must be so isolating. So isolating. That number increases to 89% which is actually the most troubling for me because it's okay, it's not okay, let me take that back. You should always be comfortable talking about something that you feel you need more information on, sure. that you're struggling with, anything like that. But if you feel like you can't manage your debt, it's so important yeah. to talk about it and get the help. Yeah. So the fact that 89% of Atlantic Canadians who are struggling with debt won't or can't feel they can't talk about it is really troubling for me. Because People are often worried about what people think of them. Other than that, why else are they afraid? So some of the responses that we got in the survey, it was that they thought they'd be judged by others, right? Some of it was a fear of failure. I don't want people to think I failed at this in life. Uh, the shame that comes with it. But in a lot of cases, Jason, it's a life event that gets people into this circumstance. So mm. it's not, you know, frivolous spending or, you know, spending without care or anything like that. It's in this day and age, actually, it's because of increased interest rates and inflation and sort of the, right off the pandemic, right? So the perfect storm of situations right now that are finding people having to access credit just to pay their bills, right? Just to put food on the table, they're needing to access credit. And that is not something that the average person would have planned for because we have lived in a time of low interest rates forever. Yeah. Right? been a very, very long time. And then one of those really large circumstances that is a life-changing, life-altering thing that can put you in, I don't want to say financial ruin, but can create a situation where if you don't pay attention, you will dig yourself into ruin, um, is the end of a long relationship. So the breakup of a marriage or cohabitation mm -hmm. or some form of partnership. And as we're talking about this, it occurs to me that the debt problems and the relationship problems are the two things that we feel least comfortable talking to people about. Yeah. And then they compound in a way um, with about the same force as compound interest I manage and they sort of deteriorate and drive us down. Absolutely, so one of the leading causes of insolvency is relationship breakdown. But what we found in talking to people over the years is that sometimes, not always, because there's lots of reasons that relationships um, don't last, right, and they break down. But oftentimes, it's the stress of the finances that created that sort of wedge in the relationship. They weren't talking about it, or they were fighting about it, or bickering, or, you know, there's, there was stress that was created in the relationship because of finances. So the sooner you get help and talk about and understand what the options are to get yourself back on a better financial footing, you can actually improve your relationship. Yeah, it's so funny you should, you, uh, you should say that. So I'm, um, I'm not married now, I, I was. Well, I guess technically I'm still married. I'll be divorced soonish. Uh, and uh, over a decade ago, I had uh, damage to a rental property that I had that uh, wasn't covered by insurance for a variety of reasons. We don't have to get into that. Uh, <laughs> I ended up bankrupt.
mm -hmm. uh, and my wife at the time. This is well over a decade ago. But the period of time during the state of bankruptcy was probably one of the most peaceful parts of our entire marriage. Because you, what do you fight about? Yeah. Like you're not, where are we gonna go eat? We're not gonna, you didn't do this. Well, why didn't you fill up the third car? Like what, like, what, <laughs> <laughs> what are you, what, are, what did you buy online this time? Like, and, and it's just, it removes so much of that, mm -hmm. that stress. Yeah. So, th and that gives me a little bit of an idea in our conversation here. Can we maybe remove some of that darkness about what happens when you call a licensed insolvency trustee and what your options are. Yeah, absolutely. So when someone comes to see us, there's really two things that they would follow through with, with us. And that's a consumer proposal or a bankruptcy. That doesn't mean that's the only advice we're going to provide. So one of the things I like to educate people on are who is the right person to call if you're struggling with your debt. There's lots of companies out there saying that they can solve your debt problems, but unless they are federally regulated licensed insolvency trustee, they're actually not the right people to call. They, the only person who can do a consumer proposal or a bankruptcy is a licensed insolvency trustee. So if you sign up with one of these companies, they call themselves sometimes debt consultants, um, they'll charge you a fee and then they'll refer you to a trustee that you could have called on your own for free. So really important to understand that a licensed insolvency trustee or nonprofit credit counselor, also good, so Credit Counseling in Newfoundland and Labrador, Al Entel's executive director there, they are a fabulous organization, but make sure that it's a nonprofit credit counselor or a licensed insolvency trustee that you're looking for for the advice. That's where you're going to get the right advice at the lowest cost because our fees come out of the creditor's money, right? So the creditors so the, really so pay the our fees. That's owed. Gets okay. That's right. So let's break down uh, the stigma a little bit. So 51% of Canadians don't know what a consumer proposal is. 58% of Canadians know a little bit about bankruptcy, but don't really understand what happens in a bankruptcy or if they can keep their assets, those types of things. So there's definitely lots of myths out there, I would say. Yeah, because you can keep your car or maybe you can keep your house as long yeah. as like you can reaffirm that debt mm -hmm. and as long as it's a good idea for you to do so like right. don't go making payments on stuff that you shouldn't be that's yeah. absolutely right and that's one of the things that we go through with our clients when they come in so we'll explain to them that whether it's a consumer proposal or bankruptcy your assets are not at risk as long as if you have a secured debt like a mortgage on your home it's up to date at the time you file and you keep it up to date Sure. And that's no different than if you didn't file, right? If you fall behind on your mortgage, you're at risk of the, the bank is going to call house, if you don't, yeah. Right? Yeah. So important for people to understand yeah. that. There's also assets that are exempt, completely exempt. So RSPs, for example, your creditors cannot attack your RSPs. They're completely safe. And I've seen so many times, Jason, where people just try to make it work and they're drawing down on their RSPs, which are meant for their retirement and they don't come to see us until they depleted all that. They'd have been better off going bankrupt. Absolutely, they'd be and better off having their to see RSPs us, later. Having that protected and dealing with their debt. Now they are still having to come see us and deal with their debt, but their RSPs are gone. So the sooner you come and get the right advice about your personal situation and really understand the ins and outs, people are all also worried that they'll never get credit again. Well, I can tell you I have many clients who file a consumer proposal, which about 75% of the time is the right solution, about 25% it's a bankruptcy. And within a few months, they have another credit card. But I always say to them, small amount, yes. right? Small amount of credit, use it, pay it off, use it, pay it off, help build back up your credit rating. Uh, don't you know get yourself in debt while you're in the proposal but my point is that they qualify for the debt yes right yeah I have clients who will get a new lease or a new car finance while they're in a consumer proposal as long as their income qualifies them for the vehicle they will still qualify even though they're in a proposal well I think that those are a few particularly bright spots mm -hmm. that give us uh, us an opportunity to reach back out to our audience and say if you're struggling, because a lot of us are, you can absolutely pick up the phone, you can reach out, you can go visit BDO Debt Solutions, and Nancy or somebody like her, thank you so much Nancy, uh, can guide you through the process because maybe you can keep your retirement 
don't pull it out to pay your line of credit. You, there's better ways. So thank you very much. My pleasure. And we will be right back after this. And welcome back to Out of the Fog, ladies and gentlemen, the handsome and charming. And you're aging very well, Rob. For a man of 65, you look incredible. <laughs> no, Thank I, you. I want to go exactly as gray as you are, and I would be cool if it happened like today. You look fantastic. I'll take it as a compliment. It is a Thanks. compliment. Uh, Mr. Rob Jennings of East Coast, Mortga East Coast Mortgage Brokers. You're an accredited mortgage professional Canada, which is like a designation, right? Uh, which means, I guess, basically, that you have as much training as one gets in the home financing industry. Is that fair-ish? There is training, but it, in my opinion, is very much an experience-based industry. Oh, you know, it, uh, you. Uh, the more mortgages you do, the more you see, the more you can help people in, you know, unique situations. And the more you learn which is kind of why we're here now. So the first half of the show, we had a lot of conversations uh, with uh, Nancy Snedden from BDO about debt and about how to manage finances and about uncovering some of the fear that keeps people for looking for assistance, from looking for assistance, when they're concerned about their own finances. And being in real estate and in conversation with a lot of people in the mortgage industry regularly, it appears to me that there are people whose terms on their mortgages that they signed three, four, five years ago are coming up for renewal soon and people are worried about a stark, a stark adjustment in their monthly finances. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, so a couple of things, um, you know, very curious to see what Nancy said because that very much plays into what uh, we do. Um, so I was, on, I was on here in February, yeah. you know, and I can't remember what I said, but uh, I probably said, you know, volatility, expect yep. the unexpected, and it's been, you know, it's been a year, right? And, uh, and you know, the, the spring rates went down. We actually saw inflation start to come under control in the spring, and rates started to go down, and then in May, uh, CPI shot back up, and we had a, a summer where um, rates were generally increasing, and then all of a sudden, as the fall rolled, uh, rolled around, we, we've seen interest rates decrease. So it's been pretty volatile, and now the talk is, what's gonna happen in 24, what's gonna happen in 25, what's gonna happen for all these people who bought a house in 2019 and in 2020, whose mortgages are inevitably coming up for renewal, and obviously the people in the market still looking to purchase their first home or their dream home. I mean, housing is very much uh, top of the news right now on a part of every politician's uh, campaign trail. And it's a big part of the whole national thing. And that's something that continually irritates me just as somebody who loves where he lives and who operates a real estate business here. Our national news when it comes to real estate is all but irrelevant to our local market in a lot of ways. And it's very dramatic. Like the news, obviously, you know, uh, people talk about clickbait and, and, and people talk about, you know, media, and social media, um, but the stats are very alarming. I, I saw a stat that, you know, housing in Ontario is down 15% since May. Yeah. Right, that's six months ago. Yeah. That's very dramatic. But if you look at Atlantic, we're actually still above water since May. You know? Yeah, our average sale price, number of transactions, number, so the number of people who buy and sell houses is down. Absolutely. Signi significantly. 30%-ish. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, over, over last yeah. year. But sale prices, the cost of the average home or the benchmark price is actually slightly up. 1.5% up. So you're exactly. Right. So yeah. our, our market, our market is down because there's less business happening. It's just slow. But our prices 
are up. And that's like an inventory thing. So I, I'd like to get sort of like a state of the union here. Yeah. So you threw a couple of words out there that I kind of want to define for the audience. You talked about inflation, which really just means the degree to which everything in your life costs more than it used to, right? And then we talk about um, your the federal government adjusting interest rates. So that's really the only tool they have to help protect us from ourselves, right? Yeah, and that's essentially what they did, you know. Um, the government, unfortunately, uh, underestimated inflation post-COVID. Uh, supply chain interruptions, I probably used that term uh, back in February. I can report now that supply chain interruptions are back to normal, right? You know, this crazy COVID pandemic that we went through uh, when everything got locked down and every business shut down and manufacturing halted and, and, and you know, um, global su supply chains just halted and, and, and took a real long time to get back to normal. Well, they're back to normal, you know? And so the number one thing driving inflation right now is demand inflation, which of course is being reeled back pretty quickly by these increasing interest rates. And demand inflation really just means like um, that law of economics. The more of something, the more people who want a thing, the more expensive that thing becomes, basically. Absolutely. So if we make less people capable of acquiring it by increasing interest rates, that'll force the price of it down. Exactly, and if I could try to, if I could show you some charts. The cool thing about COVID is when we were locked down in 2020, people had a really difficult time spending money. And we were actually, as a country, hoarding cash. And savings actually increased uh, significantly over those first year or two. Um, and then it started to dwindle away. People started spending their money. People started going back to Florida. People started to renovate their homes. People started to, once again, vacation, eat out a lot more, right, yeah. at the restaurants. And of course, everything was more expensive, right? And we also encouraged people to spend a bunch of money locally because all these businesses had been shut down. Go out Absolutely. to dinner, you can do Absolutely. it, it's okay. Right, but that trip to Florida is a heck of a lot more expensive post-COVID than it was pre-COVID, yes. yep. right? So what we saw was these savings rates peak and then dwindle away and now savings rates are pre-COVID levels, but we've also seen household debt increase to new all-time highs. I'm sure Nancy alluded to that. So now we're in a situation where interest rates are really, really expensive, savings are gone, debt's up. Yeah. Right, so we're in a situation where- That's a scary in, place. It is, it, well there's a lot of cracks in the economy right now, and that's why the market is predicting for rates to decrease in 2024. Right. So what are the big banks saying about, about timing on, on decreased rates? Because we just had new inflationary numbers come out for the month of November. Well, it's October's numbers. O October's yeah. numbers. Yeah. So in September, we were down to 3.8. And then in October, we're down to 3.1. Which is like right on target. Right on target. Which right. means that, as much as I don't like to say it, what the federal government has done worked exactly the way they wanted it to do. Wait, but that's what that means. Well, it took a really difficult path to get there, but yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody asks me where rates are going, and I do not have that answer. Um, they're definitely trending downwards, and there's a lot of reasons for that, you know, like we talked about household debt increasing, uh, everything is slowing down, uh, GDP is, is, is really sluggish. Um, the economy is slowing down right in front of us. And this was what they wanted to happen. That's how you bring down inflation. Um, so the banks are, 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 I've seen as early as April 2024, the beginning of uh, prime rate decreases, mid-24, uh, where most people are pretty much standing right now. Uh, the markets are agreeing to that because bond yields are starting to come down and, and, and bond yields are forecasted to continue to decrease as they project prime to, uh, and, to come and, down. And that's tied to prime. Bond rate. yields being tied to fixed okay. rates, prime being obviously tied to variable. So both are downward trending. We've even seen the, uh, the five-year Canada bond yields come down over half a percent in the past three weeks. And we're already seeing lower fixed rates because of that, because the markets are predicting, once again, lower inflation. And of course, the, the, the markets will probably react to the, the CPI today. Okay. So I'm, I'm gonna ask you what could be potentially an unfair question. Okay, because we're, we're at the time of the year where we're, we're towards the, the middle and the end of November. December is a big consumerism month. Christmas is very expensive in a lot of ways. And there are people who are worried about interest rates and they're worried about mortgage renewals. 
and we're projecting a little bit of a, of a decline in, in interest rates over the next six to 12 months, if somebody has a mortgage coming up for renewal in 24, in the second half of 24, and they're trying to get their way through the rest of this year, and they're thinking about how maybe the rate is gonna go up, and they're thinking about their budget over Christmas, how does the financially astute person manage the next year of their life? Well, you know, it's not easy. Um, the big thing here on their mortgage renewal is to be proactive. Um, we're reaching out to people um, as early as we can to guarantee interest rates against potential, you know, increases. Uh, we're continuously shopping people in that window to see if rates can lower. Uh, as news change, people may actually go from, from fixed to variable or from variable to fix. There are a lot of things at renewal that you could potentially do. You could potentially refinance, re-amortize your mortgage, spread it back out. Even things like going from bi-weekly accelerated to bi-weekly non-accelerated can free up 100 bucks a month, which that's your cable bill, that's your yeah, cell sure. phone bill. So it's very situational. Like That's the thing here. Everybody comes to me for advice, and like what you do in the fall of 24 could be a lot different than your cousin did in the, the spring of 23, you know? And what you do for your mortgage renewing um, in St. John's could be different than your cabin out around the bay. So um, it's really unfair to say that there's a blanket there is kind not, of situation. You know, yeah. um, well, it, the blanket answer is reach out to Jennings and Associates. Yeah, and, and <laughs> <laughs> of course, but uh, well, like I said, it's very situational, um, honestly, uh, like we talked about, you know, the, the drama that's on the mainland in the media and stuff like that. The most of the people that we speak to, these interest rate hikes are an inconvenience. Remember, St. John's real estate is really steady, really stable, and really affordable. The price of a house in St. John's is still half of what the price of a house a national yes, average price is, yeah. right? And, and our income as well. Our disposable income yeah. to debt ratios have always been lower in spite of slightly higher unemployment. We live within our means, and most people, I speak to a lot of people, are, have already come up for, here's the big thing, we've had increasing interest rates for you know, over a year and a half. You know, a large chunk of mortgages have already renewed into a higher rate. And people so are we just don't necessarily have, yeah. Okay, so right? Rob, thank you very much for taking your time to come out. Uh, thank you guys for listening, and um, don't be, take a book, take a page from Rob and Nancy's books. Uh, if you're concerned about it, just talk to the professional. You don't have to be so afraid. We will be right back after this. And welcome back. So moral of the story on this one, I got two. One, even when it's really This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Provide feedback on this show or find out how you can get involved. Email us at comments at rogerstv.com or visit our website. TSC has exciting offers every day on gifts for everyone. A new Today Showstopper. Oh, yes. Big hug for Mom of the Year. Holiday pricing on top brands. Hubby, check. Dad, check. Sweet treats and gift sets my cousin will love. 